In September of 2001, Werner Sensbach was enrolled in an art class at the University of Virginia, having retired from the university as the head of the planning department. When the class met the day after the 9-11 attacks, some of the students asked the art professor if they could paint the destruction as a way of dealing with their emotions. When Sinsbach told the professor he was not interested in painting the scenes of 9-11, the professor suggested that he paint a scene from his own past. This suggestion led to a series of paintings that reflected Sinsbach's experiences as a German soldier during World War II on the Russian front. In 2014, Sinsbach talked about his art, the war, and what it was like growing up in Nazi Germany. What I observe is from, remember from that time is basically, is you could summarize it, you could say growing up absurd. It was not a normal childhood. Born in the city of Mannheim in 1923, Sinsbach grew up during a period of great economic and political instability. After World War I, there was uh, massive uh, famines. Uh, I remember kids my age running on the street with bow-legged kids, all curvy and, and not enough food, not enough nourishment. The Treaty of Versailles had intended to launch Germany on a path to democracy, but harsh economic reparations had the opposite effect. Democracy can really flourish only in a well-nourished country. A, a country that is starving cannot think about democracy. Hitler took advantage of Germany's suffering to gain political power. In these turgid waters, this where movements such as the one that Hitler started could really grow. Sensbach's extended family owned an iron foundry, and his mother worked as a midwife, providing him with a relatively comfortable life. He attended an academic high school, or gymnasium, he belonged to the Boy Scouts, or Young Folk. He socialized with his friends, and he ran track. However, the Nazi party cast an ever-darkening shadow over his life. But you would see the little things, like uh, one day maybe the editor of a local newspaper who had been very liberal uh, uh, was fired. So. My father reported on that, that another one going, one liberal voice is gone. So he saw that step by step as to there was a, a loss of liberties that happened everywhere. The influence of the Nazi party was also felt at his school. These, I guess you could call them patriotistic or uh, chauvinistic ideas, they were not, they were dictated by the teacher that you had to write down in your notebook. You can always tell the difference if it was some a composition you had to make yourself or it was dictated to you. And eventually you can see how it became more and more toward the Nazi idea. As Hitler imposed a police state, it became increasingly difficult to say or do anything to challenge the Nazi party. My father was uh, uh, called up by the Gestapo a number of times. So it, it was really a tough thing to, to get not caught in that. Because this, uh, <clears throat> this culture of, uh, of ratting on others uh, it, it began to grow. And it was really almost a, a culture that the communists later took over in East Germany. Uh, there was one time a raid uh, where most of the fathers, the communist fathers of my schoolmates were, were just routed up and put in jail and just hung, garroted a few days later as having conspired against the state. In 1942, after graduating from high school, Sinsbach was drafted into the Air Force. Even though he was bitterly opposed to the war, he believed he had no other choice. My best high school friend, he was a, a conscientious objector. He was also drafted into that unit, had to remove um, uh, booby traps and, uh, and, and mine, mine fields. And there were some in Germany who said they would not want to shoot. 
It would not, uh, and, but they would be drafted. And their assignment was always then to clear landmines. And that meant, in effect, that on the average, they lasted four weeks, not more than four weeks, stepping on a landmine somewhere. That was basically, if you were assigned to that unit, that was the end of your existence. And that's what happened to him. Since Bach spent a year in the south of France, serving in the German Air Force. It was never anywhere near an airplane. That unit that was assigned to was supposed to take a position somewhere near the Mediterranean, near Marseille, and to help them get a, a, a base camp established. In 1943, Sinsbach received his orders to join the army on the Russian front. After Stalingrad, when they lost 250,000 people uh, in Stalingrad, they were casting about, looking for soldiers in every nook and corner, and so I was sent from the Air Force directly to the infantry. In the winter of 1944, Sinsbach fought the Russians in the Ukraine under extreme conditions. And so I spent many, many a night out in the snow, <laughs> covered with a foot of snow when, I, when you woke up, you know, in, 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 in the foxhole. But it was mostly at the time when there was already movement back. The German army was re retreating. I was assigned to a, a machine gun uh, unit. There was one machine gunner and two guys carrying the ammunition. I carried ammunition, and uh, this is how we moved back one after another. And, uh, the, the, the losses were just um, monumental. The battleground in the Ukraine was one of chaos and confusion. After one skirmish, Sinsbach was separated from his unit and became caught up in the tide of evacuees. He illustrated this event in one of his later paintings. These are all Ukrainians leaving their homes, retreating, going, going westward, uh, taking all their belongings in back. So, was, and this is a day I've mentioned that I spent uh, being separated from from the unit, uh, where I was again carrying these damn uh, ammunition cases. Uh, they were supposed to carry back safely. And as I happened to see that horse, I threw it over its back, hanging down both sides. And I, that white horse and I moved through that area for a whole day and uh, until the evening. And I eventually had to release him again and take refuge in, in, in the building. So this is one of these scenes of, of confusion that happened then. Reunited with his unit, Sinsbach continued to fight and retreat, but there were occasional lulls in the fighting. One afternoon, I remember, and this is part of the, one of the pictures that I, paintings I made later, uh, I had to, they sent me out to reconnoiter to find out how far the Russians actually were. Totally field, ice, snow-covered field, and I had to move right, walk into that area, uh, in total view of whatever they might be. And I walked, and I walked for, for an hour. Didn't see anybody. Sun was shining, a beautiful day. And I thought, it's unreal. This is what life is about. Nobody's shooting, there's no war. I just imagined that. And at that moment, uh, I saw that little cottage there, and I stopped, knocked, and and then they opened, and inside there were two people, a real old man and a young woman with a baby. And she had a baby cradle hanging from the ceiling there, and I, I asked for some water to drink. and. They even didn't have any water, had, had nothing there. And, and they produced eventually some milk and handed me the milk. I happened to have a loaf of bread with me, and I handed them the bread. 
and then I cut it and we shared that bread and they said, Merry Christmas. Well, it was January, but I all of a sudden remembered that the Russian Orthodox Christmas is on the 3rd of January. That was their Christmas day. Out of 40 men in his company, Sinsbach was one of only eight to survive the fighting and the harsh Russian winter. Despite their heavy losses, the German army launched a counteroffensive in March as the snows began to thaw. About 100 miles southwest of Kiev, Sinsbach found himself engaged in a fierce machine gun battle. The, the battle ensued, uh, we were prepared for that, in that two uh, fighting groups were facing each other on, on hillsides, facing each other, so you could actually, with some good sight, could identify other soldiers on the other side. So on one side the Russians, on the other side the, the Germans. Uh, we came in, was early in the morning, fight started around eight o'clock or so. And uh, basically guys taking aim at others, anything that moved on, on the other side. And I was with that, still that uh, unit of a, a machine gun. And the machine gunner at one point said, out of ammunition, I need ammunition. I was about 20 feet away in a, in a, in a foxhole and with that ammunition. And eventually I got up and had to bring it to him so he could continue firing and shooting. But as I got up again to get back to my foxhole, to, this is when I got hit. By, by bullet and from by somebody who could really shoot well. And I guess I, as I was going down, I could almost see out of the corner of my eye over on the other side, somebody throwing up his hands in sheer uh, enjoyment of what he had caught. I could see the guy who shot me. And, uh, but then I, I fell down, I didn't know what happened, of course, and I, I fell down and um, fell behind the place that there was ruts about a foot and a half high from tracks that had been made there, covered by snow, I fell behind those, and at the same moment uh, as I fell down, the word came, the German troops to retreat and everybody got up and left uh, to, to get back and, and, and behind that hill and I guess they didn't know what happened to me because they had just fallen down and they was lying expecting the attack of the Russian troops eventually and as that did not happen the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, I began to wonder what, what will happen, what I can do. And uh, all in full sight of the Russian sharpshooters, I began to move on my right elbow because it was the left hip that had been injured around the bottom of that hill in the protection of that rut uh, road of the road until it came to the other side of the hill. It took about three and a half hours to do that. And behind that hill there were still a couple of stragglers from the, from the German unit and they saw me and I called to them to help me take me back and they said, well, no we can't, you, you're too heavy. And it would have let, just left me. And then at that moment, I saw that ladder leaning against the house. And I said, do you see that ladder? Use it as a stretcher. You can take me back and you are, you are the medics. You're out of, out of the uh, firing line. And they saw the advantage for them and took me out. Brought back behind German lines, 
Sinsbach was transported by horse cart and then by train back to Germany. When he finally received medical attention after three weeks, he was put into a full body cast. Uh, they took me back then uh, to Germany, West Germany, and uh, you know, it was, uh, I mean, it was in May by the time, uh, 1944, and I remember the invasion of the Americans at the Omaha, Omaha Beach. They had to take me down in the hospital bed all the way down into the, into the shelter, and they were cussing over that, and everybody in the hospital was, was happy to know that the Americans finally attacked. Uh, I mean, everybody was aware that this thing is coming, coming crushing down sooner or later. During the summer and fall of 1944, Sinsbach recuperated in Mannheim, which was then the target of frequent Allied bombing attacks. In December, Sinsbach was sent back to the Eastern Front. This time, the transport train only went as far as Poland, where the German army was in full retreat. His squad was comprised of other wounded veterans. These were all people who'd been injured badly. There was a guy with a wooden leg and processes and one eye and limping around and just really sad looking bunch of, of, of men there. And we basically marched through the night. We started off in, at nightfall and going westward. During the march, Sinsbach encountered a group of people that would later become the subject for another painting. And it was snowing and and all of a sudden, a group of people joined us, coming from, from one side. We were walking side by side. I couldn't identify anybody and who they were, except that they all had wool blankets over their faces and to protect themselves from the snow coming down. And I began to wonder who, who they might be, what, what, what group that was that didn't have any uniform on was office. We also wore blanks that were heads until I realized that these were people who had just been evacuated from Auschwitz maybe that very afternoon. So this group of, I was with was about 12 guys walked along these people from, from Auschwitz for about an hour, looking at each other, staring at each other uh, in, in total despair. It wasn't until after the war, when Sinsbach learned about the Nazi death camps, that he realized the larger story of the Auschwitz victims. If you say where you have concentration camps, the name, of course, that is, was known to everybody. It's where the Germans were afraid of. But the death camps, that is a different story. And if somebody says he didn't know about it, you can't believe him, because he may not have known it. That, that is, again, another thing in a, in a dictatorial society. The way information travels from one part of the country is so tightly controlled that you hardly ever know, you don't read it in the paper, and unless somebody tells you you've just come from some place, you're not aware of it. It's almost like a submarine that is subdivided individually so that they can cut off hermetically every piece and not permit anything to move back and forth. But from what I learned later is that we are put into another camp, uh, the name of which I forgot, uh, which was, however, liberated by the Russians two days later. So my assumption is, and I hope I'm right with that, that all of those guys whom I saw there, they all survived that war. As the war came to an end, Sinsbach managed to escape the Russian army and make his way back to Mannheim. But the years after the war were not easy. Mannheim, like most other German cities, was in ruins and there were widespread food shortages. You had to spend a great uh, deal of effort and a great part, of many hours of the day, of, of scrounging for food, you know, where we could find it. Uh, uh, in, in the first uh, 
months uh, <clears throat> when I came home and had no, uh, no food ration papers, <clears throat> I took ev off every day after work. I took off from Mannheim <clears throat> on my bicycle to travel to the uh, Odenwald to get uh, baskets full of, of apples and fruits of the land and cabbage and whatever that is needed to, to feed a family. Did that every day for a month on end, you know, just living out of, uh, from hand to mouth. And it, it was really a starvation period. Despite the hardship, Sinsbach felt fortunate to have beaten the odds and escaped the war with his life. Well, this was uh, from the uh, first uh, class reunion of high school class. Mm -hmm. You know, those people of about 32 that were in the class, only about 12 came back. So it was about two-thirds that perished in, in the war. In the 1950s, Sensbach studied architecture and city planning in the United States, where he married and raised his family. As the head of planning at the University of Virginia, he oversaw the design of many new buildings at the university. By the time of his death in 2015, Werner Sinsbach had created a distinguished body of work, hundreds of oil paintings, watercolors, and woodcuts of buildings, still lifes, and landscapes of the Virginia countryside. Many of his experiences in the war remained forgotten until the attacks of September 11 and the challenge of creating art from his wartime memories. It was an, an assignment, and um, the teacher called it memory paintings. And so I pulled those out basically out of deep layers of consciousness. It's a liberating influence to be rid of things that you may have had to push away in order to, to be able to function at all. I guess you begin to learn pretty early on the, the uh, I guess you could almost say sanctity of life, how important life is. Uh, you, you begin to think about the many hours a mother had to spend to teach you how to walk and ride a bicycle and take you to school. And 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 the, all the effort of a family that goes into making a person out of this bundle of of energy, and then sending him off into war and be shot and be killed in one afternoon, and the absurdity of of, of all of that. And once you begin to see that, you also will have to decide that you are not going to be a victim of that situation. You want to survive, you want to get out of that.